magistralities of our predictive modeling. And Professor Karen, Hans Kamermans is a professor at the Lake of the, in the Faculty of Archaeology at Lake University. A predictive modeling, a view from the Ivory Tower. What I will do, I will present a critical view of predictive modeling. Because I, I'm, uh, I'm, yeah, I have my doubts about the use of predictive modeling in, in uh, heritage management because of the people who are that when they invited me, so people are kind of surprised with that. I made some critical noises about the use of predictive modeling in the And so what I will do, I will give you a fresh course of predictive modeling. I will list all the problems with predictive modeling. Present some new avenues or make some remarks about recent developments in the use of predictive modeling, statistics in, 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 uh, in predictive modeling. It is complicated, again, that's reasonable, so no judgment. I really have to. But, but uh, many of your participants are, are, are simply not bothering about the statistics because, because they made every mistake in the world. We talk about association or correlation. Is it causality? Can you really predict on the basis of the correlation? Should that be causality? Those are interesting topics. Okay? If we don't understand the relation between the soil map and site density, can we say, okay, apparently there is a correlation. I don't understand why there is a correlation, but I'm going to be able to predict it. Some people just remember. I think first have to figure out why there is a and then the test data for the predictive model. That always is that's expensive because most of the time you need new data to test the model because you use all your data to build the model. You then you have to go out and do the survey here, come up with new data, test the error, etc. etc. Test the model. So there's that. If you want to know more about this, you can read the PhD pieces of Philip to Half. This book is called Case Studies by the Master. The model class, it's, it's, it's open access. So can we come back on it tomorrow for this? Is, this is open access, you can find it here. Okay, so after five minutes of study, our conclusion was that the current form of inductive predictive modeling are not suitable for our experiment in the Netherlands, and I like to extend it to the rest of you, including it in the United States. Now, we published our results in 20 articles and three books. These are the books. Um, and uh, again, you can find lots of it in the so you can open it um, And we have some support on this, uh, on this view. If you read uh, David Weasley from Sazerti University, the writer of the V handbook of the use of GS and other young people, he's saying correlative, that's another word for inductive, inductive predictive does not actually. Work very well and more significantly will lead to an increasingly underrepresented problem. And so he's saying if you're using the existing data to build a map, then of course the areas where you find most of the data will be the most will be the areas where but the prediction will be that you will find more under the so you will never look in the areas without sites. So it means that the difference between the unknown and the known will be increasing. Thomas Whitney, an American predictive model, who now moved to Australia. In many cases, it's too costly. If you do it right, predictive model is not cheap. It's cost a lot. It is too costly or even possible to do a part of the prediction model. And ultimately, Resulting model does not provide better insight into the site placement process than intuition. That's cheap, intuition is cheap. Yeah? And if it doesn't perform better than intuition. Okay, enough criticism. <laughs> um, time for positive contribution. Um, in the 70s, I came into contact uh, with 
that evaluation. Uh, I have to put a bachelor, BA in physical geography, and I'm going to get a physical geography for the second time they were teaching me in the book. Showed me how land evaluation works, and the definition of land evaluation is a technique developed by some scientists to generate different models for land use to raise an ecological and social data. And I figured out that you could use that technology as some kind of deductive form of predictive model. You have to build the model and you compare that with environmental factors and you come up with a suitability map. Um, these are different steps in the uh, digital model. A model framework, in that framework, is using four different models. We use an annotation model, a biological model, an epigenetic model, and an application model. And in the end, he combines all those models into a model. These again, it takes way away to look, too long to look at all the things. But this is an example of that. There's a flow chart for all those four things, but this is the one for the digital elevation model. So it's not only using the current digital elevation model, but she's also using the historical maps. And she's also using aerial photographs to, to uh, correct the digital elevation model for the past. And the end is to look at temporal digital elevation model for, so for several periods in the past. But if you want to predict our level of science location, we need insight into the variables that they put in the decision to make that. That's critical for the level of predicting our We still don't know. We need more insight into those. And why do people choose to do Not to use the area in an optimal, optimal, optimal way. We should have a good idea. And the funny thing is, in the beginning, people thought that model will help us to do that. If you look at Christopher Parker already in 1985, that's really almost 30 years ago, he said that predictive modeling would allow a broad range of potential constraints of human settlements to be evaluated for their <coughs> So he thought that manipulation would help us to evaluate what is important uh, in terms of sort of system construction of psychological, social and and that's something we, we did a good deal of about in the years. So in conclusion, for subsistence we do do a lot of the beautiful land duration and the end of the And the direction we have gone in the this model of all those separate things like digital animation models, training, etc. So we have to go in the direction. But for cultural, social, and technological factors, And in my view, one of the ways we could do it is again use predictive modeling in a more deductive way. So simply build more models based on the insight of decisions we think people would make in the past. And build more and more different models that confront them with the landscape and the reconstruction of the landscape that's been found in the same past. And the numbers make a comment about the past. So I've used this. Thank you very much. So, um, it starts the, the talks of the predictive session, and the first one, so um, uh, the first talk is devoted to the results of my project from the predictive side. And this uh, joint presentation between me and uh, Gabriel and Didia. Uh, okay, in terms of estimate, estimation of archaeological potential with page rank basic predictive model, the MAPA project results. Um, we will present the results of, uh, of our project, um, a very complex uh, project with a case study, the urban area of, uh, of Pisa. Uh, it's been a two year project. Uh, with a mathematician, uh, geologist, a uh, lot of different uh, competence uh, in every field of, uh, 
of our, from our our project. Um, to speak about the result, uh, I had to, to start from the beginning. Uh, the, 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 the data, the, the, the huge amount of data we, we used for, uh, for our estimation. Uh, we used all kinds of primary data, geographical and geomorphological data, urban data, uh, all kinds of archaeological data, uh, archaeological finds, building archaeology, and uh, all kinds of uh, historical, uh, historical data, such as uh, 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 historical cartography or uh, the written, the written source, to uh, develop uh, secondary data uh, against our, our money. Uh, the first step was to, to thinking about the, the archaeological potential. What? What is the archaeological potential? Um, we thought that uh, it represents the possibility that the more or less significant archaeological certification is, uh, is preserved and uh, is uh, calculated by analyzing and studying a series of historical archaeological environmental data uh, retrieved from various sources. Uh, type of sediment, density of sediment. Multi layering of deposits, uh, removal or not removal, nature of archaeological deposit, and the degree of preservation. Um, it was uh, very complex to, uh, to analyze all this data together. So uh, we started a uh, work, workflow uh, diagram. The first step was to uh, was the categorization of archaeological data. All the uh, archaeological findings from the 17th century till, uh, till today uh, were uh, divided in different uh, categories and uh, to which category we assign a value of potential, of uh, uh, the potential value of archaeological information. Uh, we see this later. Uh, then we try to shape the urban element of, uh, of, our, of our town, it has uh, the shape of uh, the Roman domes or uh, of uh, the tower houses and, and so on. Um, about the relation, uh, maybe you will, uh, will explain uh, why relations are so, so important in our, in our model. Uh, we uh, studied the, the, the we try to stress the relation between archaeological categories in the same chronological period. This is an example. If uh, we have archaeological findings about a uh, uh, medieval uh, tower house, uh, for example, a piece of floor or a piece of wall, uh, we uh, know that uh, around the tower houses. Uh, there, there was an alley or a shop in front of the tower house, uh, the, the road, and uh, in the back side, uh, a courtyard. And with one element, they can create relation with other elements that uh, I haven't uh, found in an archaeological excavation. I, I try to um, give the main ideas of the mathematical models um, we use. But before, let me um, point out the difference um, between the, a mathematical modeling and a statistical modeling. And the main difference between mathematical and statistical modeling is uh, in the assumptions. And that's the main difference in uh, modeling between what, what we did and what I found in the literature. So, where the model comes from? In the early discussion with the archaeological and geological group, um, we uh, understood that a key issue in identifying in, uh, in detecting the archaeological potential is the identification of relations between finds, between quantities, both in spatial and 
functional terms because this relation can tell you that many files, one near to each other, can form or not form a more complex structure. And so they can influence the potential of the error, they can let the potential grow up or go down. Since we model the subsurface with a three dimensional grid, our rule should have been that any cell can attribute potential to the surrounding cells or receive importance by the surrounding cells. And we immediately um, an analogy with a very uh, well known algorithm from information theory and mathematics um, that is the page rank, the one used by search engine to uh, rank web pages. An analogy with this one here because in uh, uh, page rank algorithms, uh, web pages that place the growth of our cells attributes important to pages it, they link to and receive important from page they link to. How does it work for our uh, modeling archaeology? We need two mainly two quantities. The first one is the initial value of potential of the cells. And this is given by the finding the data you have. So that we are expected by how we assign it. The other one is we have to assign how much of the potential is spread by one cell to the other one, assigning weights to the links, assigning value to the links. In that way, you obtain a matrix and you solve a linear system, we solve equations, to obtain the solution uh, of the system is what we consider the final value of our estimated potential. So the point is how to construct that matrix. So we need um, rules to assign the value of this, matrix, of this matrix. First rule, the area of inputs of each cell, of each cell with the file, is related to the importance, to the value, of the functional area the cell belongs to. So for example, if we are in the city, we can expand, in a, we can, um, the area of influence is bigger than if you are in a local area. That's because in the city there's much more probability to find other findings. But the weights are not distributed uniformly, but they are weighted by the geomorphological data, whatever it means. But anyway, the geomorphology influences the way you distribute the weights because it, it provides a natural basic level of how the potential can spread. Uh, you can see, uh, unfortunately, uh, the slide is not so, long. so good. All the archaeological, uh, the, the, the map of archaeological potential uh, from, uh, for, uh, for each community. Uh, before we create one, one, uh, one map, one final, one final map, uh, we uh, made uh, appropriate validation uh, to uh, verify, to, to check if the, the page rank model work, works good. Uh, we, we found out that for a uh, period for, 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 for which we have a lot of data, uh, the model works well, uh, while for periods like the Tuscan period, for which we have uh, few, few data, uh, we have to improve, to improve the, the model. And at the end, this is the final uh, page rank uh, map of uh, archaeological potential of, of the urban area. Uh, we will, uh, if, if, the result of our, of our interpolation, of our uh, elaboration. You can see in, in, a, in a 3D vision where the highest peak of, uh, of archaeological potential, for example, here in uh, Piazza del Duomo, uh, near the, 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 Ling, the Lingen Tower, for example, or along the, the Arno River, for example, 
or in, a, in an area outside, just outside uh, the, the town that's called uh, Area X Shire. And uh, this is uh, a five level map of archaeological potential. We uh, divided our, our level uh, with a, a, a geometrical interval uh, because we want to give uh, importance also to a low potential area. Uh, because uh, uh, we, we don't want to have a, uh, a very large area with low potential, but we want to, to see the increment of the potential in an exponential way and uh, to give importance also to the low potential area. Thank you.